Happy holidays. It's Flames Nation Radio. He's Shane. I'm Ryan. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. As usual, we're delivered to you by DoorDash and by the beautiful people at Eau Claire Distillery, makers of Rupert's Whiskey, the official whiskey of the Calgary Flames. Uh, this holiday season, you can just say the Rupert's Whiskey makes an easy gift for the Flames fan on your list. Shane, how are you doing? I like your hat. Thank you. I'm good. I'm School's almost done, so it's uh, time to relax after finals. That's good. Still got another, um, week. another week of that, though. It's been kind of a, an interesting week for the Flames. They, uh, in the words of beloved poet Meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. They won two out of three, and they. If we're gonna, we'll, we'll go through the the week that was very quickly in the rundown. They beat the Montreal, or they lost the Montreal Canadiens two one uh, in the Sean Monahan revenge game. And let's just say Sean looked good. Sean looked good. Definitely not hundred percent because he never is. But Sean looked and good. And he's out now. Like he's actually out now. Yeah, he, uh, like, he, he was in a, they, the next game. They listed him as out. He was in a walking boot. Yeah. The day of, he apparently had not practiced. Uh, he was just playing games. Had not practiced for the preceding week. But uh, my guess is, really, really wanted to come back to Calgary and play his old team. And he got a couple assists. He played pretty well. Like he is, you know, for as far as homecoming goes, like he got a standing O from the crowd. He played pretty well. And then never saw him again. <laughs> So, Sean, we hope you're doing well. Uh, we well, please, it's hard, please hard stop to getting hurt. Jake Allen's down there making 5,000 saves, stealing the game, right? Like, like yeah, it was Jake, John Monaghan night, and it became and, all about Jake look, Allen. Let, and let's be honest, uh, the Flames put up, what, 40-some shots on Jake Allen, and Jake Allen saw most of them. And uh, the in tight ones too, though, like he was able to get some quick rebound chances and get his pads on him. So. Yeah, it was it was a combination of was he was good when he had to be, and the Flames probably wanted him to be a bit more challenged. But yeah, it's the it's the type of game where if you play that style of game against anyone else, you probably do okay. And lo and behold, uh, the on Saturday night against the Washington Capitals, they played more or less the same style of game against the Capitals and won five to two. Uh, it was a pretty good game. They played pretty well. They, you know, they let the foot off the gas a little bit late, as t- teams tend to do when they have a multi multi goal lead. But they played well. Uh, it was a three point night for both uh, Michael Backlund and Adam Rizicka. Uh Adam Rizicka is, I think, second three point night of the season. Uh, in the in the last ten games, I think he has nine or ten points. He's doing pretty well. Uh, so that was the story of that game. Uh, Dan Vladar looked good. The Flames gave him some run support, and they won the game. Then on uh, two, Monday night, the Flames hosted uh, Mike Gould's favorite team, the Washington Capitals. Or not the Washington Capitals. He there should like that. the Washington Capitals. They're really yeah, good. Mike. They got they got Nick Backstrom. What's up? Uh, but they they actually hosted the Arizona Coyotes, and it was it was a style clash in a lot of ways, and not just on the ice in terms of visually, because the Flames are playing their their '90s pedestals, and the uh, the Coyotes were wearing their sweet Kachina jerseys. So it looked good on the ice, although. The, the they didn't really mesh together in terms of the two styles of jerseys. Yeah, they were and, pretty contrast of each other, dark black and pure white. Yeah, and uh, and folks, if you're if you ever, I, I'll I'll make a confession. When I'm scrolling through our photo archive, looking for photos of of the current game, half the time I don't notice that the Flames pedestals are a Flames jersey because they kind of look like a Florida Panthers jersey if you're not paying attention with the the red and then like the dark below. So. Uh, I know it's not the exact same color scheme the old admit, school when you're looking yeah. the old school, the, the Panthers retros, the leaping, the leaping cat. Yeah. But the flames won three to two. It was to be completely honest, a really boring game. Uh, mm-hmm. The flames seemed completely content to play a boring game. They were not at their best. They had a, a second period lull. Elias Lindholm com- uh, complained to the media afterwards that he didn't think they played a very good game in the second period, but they, you know, they got the right result. Uh, they, you know, it was, Let's, they if you fell go, asleep like the flames themselves fell asleep like the fans. I would <laughs> like, I would say as much so as slow. as much as the Washington game was a template for the flames in terms of them taking advantage of mistakes, making good things happen, and then pouncing. The Coyotes are a good road team. Daryl Sutter said this before uh, before Wednesday's game or yeah before Monday's game that they're pretty good. They're a good road team because they they're playing the thirteenth road game uh, in a row. Uh, because of the renovations to Mullet Arena to uh, to accommodate the NHL locker rooms. So they were playing a very structured, stifling, dull, boring, crappy 
sleep inducing game. And they're fine with that. They're if you're playing that far, uh, you know, that much away from your home rink, you have to adapt and you have to lull the other team in. And the Flames, they probably had a temptation to open up the game a bit and open up their own style, but they didn't do it for the most part. I mean, the goals they scored, uh, Dylan Dubé got a tip on a Chris Tanev shot and they got, generated that chance by forechecking and causing the the Coyotes to make a mistake. And then they cycled the puck and scored. Uh, the other two goals were scored off a power play goal that was set up by a Michael Backlund penalty draw driving to the net in the offensive zone. Adam Rizicka, same kind of thing. He was trying to, he was, he had possession of the puck and he was cycling it and he got hauled down drew a penalty and they scored two power play goals off the penalties that that line took. So, uh, will probably praise the Ruzichka, Backlund, Coleman line now and in the future because they've been very good. I'll yeah. say this, Adam Ruzichka, I thought he was just as good in a game where he got zero points but drew a penalty as he was in a game where he had three points because he was he was just, he still looks like he's, he's thinking about what am I supposed to be doing on the ice? But for the most part, he's doing the right things and, you know, the, the hockey is a game, especially the Flames have played the most one goal games of any team in the league right now. And I can't imagine that's not going to continue. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have to be comfortable playing those games and you have to be comfortable figuring out ways to be a difference maker in one way or the other in those types of games. And against the Coyotes, you know, Nazem Kadri, speaking of difference makers, had a, had a you know, three point night. So that's that's pretty good. Uh, well, uh, also, like if you look and watch Rizicka in the offensive zone right now, he pounces. He he yeah. seems to get extra life trying to attack and get goals, which was missing on this lineup from a lot of players throughout it. They fell into a stagnant hole where no one was really standing out amongst their peers. And Ruzicka, his youthful exuberance got put in and he if he he's great in transition through the neutral zone. But when he gets in the offensive zone, you really tell he wants to score. He wants to attack. He wants the puck on his stick and yeah. he wants to be a difference maker. And th- I think that kind of reignited the um, Manjapani Kadri Dubé line because, I mean, you you either had Huberto, who's now firing on all cylinders and going at full tilt, um, like we said he was, and he's been very, very good. And then you've got, now you've got um, Rizicka Backlund. So you've got two lines going and then you've got the Flames fourth in the second. And more than not, when you can roll over the boards and go towards the offensive zone, you're going to find more space for offense and more creativity than going back to the defensive zone. So when and, and I think that's jumbled and not chemistry, a lot of guys were trying to dig themselves out of the defensive zone still. Now they're going out and they're going right into the attack. And they've been doing that since the, the road trip uh, prior where they went two, three, and one, that road trip sets some fundamentals for them that they're still using. And it's really made me have a real positive outlook for where this team's going, because now they've got everyone, the structure's there. They've they've played within it a little loosely, but they found it. And now it's coming out every single night. Yeah. And and I think if you're, you know, if you're wondering, oh man, Ruzicka with Backlund and Coleman, the puck going in the right direction is the main reason because, like Rizicka, he's still young. He was never like it, it, dating back to his time in, in the OHL. Yeah, he, he was never he was never a defensive specialist, and that's not what you want him there for. And to be honest, if we're being completely honest here, uh, you know Jonathan Huberdeau is not a defensive specialist. I think you mentioned you know Huberdeau seems much more engaged. He seems really in the structure. He isn't really his body language isn't what am I supposed to be doing now anymore? A lot of it's just sort of degrees of execution. He's not a great battler. He's, you know, he, he's a big dude, but he's not a battler. He doesn't win a lot of 50, 50 battles. And I think it's, that'll be a work in progress because a lot of the, the thing, you know, a lot of the flames system relies on, if you look at, if you look at what, what what the the backland line was good at uh, the last while, uh, since Rizicka was put on it, if you look at what the Kadri line has been really good at the last three, four games, it's, you know, you put in Manchapani or Dubé and Kadri as a four checker, they get the puck, they drive it out. Uh, the Flames' best four checker on the, on, uh, you know, Huberto's line is his center. Uh, Toffoli isn't a great four checker. He's not bad, but that's not his thing. He's more of a, he's more of a, a shooter. So you have a four checker, a distributor and a, a shooter. And on paper, it makes sense. It, that's that's basically what the they had last year with uh, Kachuk, Goudreau, and uh, Lindholm. Lindholm, except Lindholm was the shooter. Except Lindholm was the shooter, not the forechecker. Right? And I think, and I think that's that's the that's thing. The thing. I think him One getting of used to Huberto 
need to start winning those down low board battles to get the puck off the wall and yeah. get it into open space. Now, I'm not to say that they're being bad. Toffoli has been a top, Toffoli's been pretty a good. Top eight. He gets an A minus, A plus, A A grade so far this year. He's been consistently good and producing. But I just together, no one there. Lindholm's the guy that needs to be in open space. He's always covering defensively. One of the wingers need to be the guys that get the puck off the boards. It can't yeah. be your center. And so I, if think they that, produce I think that's more points. One of those two need to be better at winning their battle. Like Toffoli's a great support guy up the boards. If the if the puck can come around and get to him on the half wall, he's good at keep it either passing it down low or keep back to the point or keeping possession of the puck. He understands that. But yeah, without with no one there to win the puck down low all the time. And then because it used to be they'd win the battle and then they'd shovel it out front to Lindholm real quick because he was always there. But now Lindholm's down low and you can't shovel it up and you need to go back up the walls and reset. And it, it it's not creating as much five on five offense as that that line has potential to create. One yeah. of the wingers need to step up and win more puck battles. Just, it, yeah. And that'll increase. And and I'd say it's put making them a little bit too reliant on, on the power play. I mean, they, they, they've been, they've been succeeding largely without a power play that's been cooking. So I think, I think there's a comfortable middle ground to be found between, Oh no, they only score on the power play and Oh no, they can't score on the power play at all. Oh no. Uh, I, I think they're getting there and I agree with you, Shane. I think there's, have the flames been playing perfect hockey? Have they been playing up to the level that we think they can eh, from time to time? And I think, the more they do that with regularity, I think the the more they're going to get in the right direction. Because I think, you know, if you look at the the last five, ten games, a lot more, much more good than bad. And the games they've lost, they lost because, you know, of, you know, gaffes and whoopsies and whatnots that end up in the back of their net. And, you know, you, you don't plan for those things. I mean, I'm sure poor Jacob Marsham did not plan on allowing a goal 13 seconds in. You could kind of understand the logic behind what he was doing. The execution, eh. Yeah, but it is what it is, right? It is what it is. And actually, that, that'll that bring us uh, to our player spotlight, which is coincidentally the other goalie. Let's talk about Dan Vildar. Um He's been awesome. Uh, oh, he's I, don't been... Think, I don't think we can dress it up any more than that. No. He's been the best goalie since the preseason. He, like, like, here, he... He was the best player in the preseason period. At the end of the by preseason, far, by far, you had us. You had Pat Steinberg. You had everyone that's talking about this, talking about how great Vladar was in the preseason. And then we see them go like we always thought they were, turn to their big money goaltender. But <laughs> I'm, I'm actually Vladar is starting again tonight. We're recording on Wednesday. They're playing the Wild at home. We're, we're based uh, disclaimer. Pat Steinberg's tweet, thanks, Pat, yeah. uh, was cool. that it looks like. Dan yeah. Vladar will be the starter. So, uh, they didn't do a full skate. Uh, there was an optional morning skate on Wednesday morning before the game against the Minnesota Wild. So it appears as if he will start. Even but that'll if, be a even third if, straight start. And even if he doesn't start, it'll still if, if they go with Markstrom, it's Markstrom. It'll be five and five in the last ten. If they go with Vladar, it'll be six for Vladar and four for Markstrom in the last ten. Either way, that's a pretty significant story because the idea that the $6 million man, the Vezina Trophy runner-up, the guy who was voted by the PHWA as the second-team all-star goaltender, as in, by our voters, the second-best goaltender in the league. So the, the league's GM said he is the second-best goaltender in the league because they voted for the Vezina. The Professional Hockey Writers Association voters, I voted. Uh, we voted him the second best goaltender in the league. So by by all consensus, by by everyone who has a say in voting, he was in the two votes. He was the second best goalie in the league. And yeah, he, if you said to me second best behind Shesterkin, I'd go, yeah, that makes sense. And then the weird thing is Shesterkin struggling and Markstrom struggling. Well, Goaltending's weird. If you look at the list of top goalies this year. It's Logan Thompson. It's Linus Olmark. It's Vitek Vanacek. It's it, no one would have. You couldn't have found a person in the world that could predict who's the top five goalies in save percentage were with a minimum of say ten games played. You you wouldn't find anybody that would have been able to predict that because goaltending is voodoo. It always is. Pinder said that he's right. It is just it, it depends on the, it depends more on the strength of the team in front of you than it does with the actual goaltender when it comes to good goals. When it comes to bad goals, well that's on the goaltenders themselves. So if you can limit the low danger goals. You give your team a chance to win. That's that's as simple as I I can 
state it. Um, and when Markstrom's running out and misplaying the puck and sliding, and then all the Montreal Canadiens need to do is quick toe drag and shoot the puck in the net. That's not, that's not good. That's you misread the situation or you didn't commit properly enough and you, you made an error. And, and that's the thing, like we need to limit the errors right now. And Vladar is not playing with very many errors in his game. Yeah, so why not? I would, I would say he, he has the calm and let's be completely honest here. That's why you spend money or you spend resources, time, effort to find a backup goalie. I'm oh, sure, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure right now, like as much as you don't want to see your star struggling, because Jordan Siglet and, and the Flames goaltending staff, they sought out both these guys. They sought out, you know, uh, our, you know, Pat Steinberg was well, you know, well connected into the, the saga that ended up with Jacob Markstrom becoming Calgary Flame when it became pretty obvious that Markstrom was going to go to market. The Flames were all over him like white on rice because they saw a guy who could play a ton and could play well and they really wanted him. And similarly, you know, after that, they, they needed a backup the following summer and they targeted Jake, they par- targeted Dan Vladar yes. because Third Vladar. Right. He was Vladar with the, the odd man out in, in Washington or in Boston. Sorry. Uh, he was the odd man out in, in Boston uh, behind, you know, Linus Olmark looked like he was the guy he there. In, he came in. Oh yeah. It was, it Olmark was, came in and they had Swayman. Yeah. And, and Swayman. Left. Yeah, and, and then they needed they Vladar was ready, and they were like, well, "We don't they, have room for you." Sorry. They had they had three guys, and uh, at the time, Swayman did not require waivers, but he was the, they felt the second best goalie, and they didn't want to carry three, so they were facing losing him on waivers. And the Flames said, "Hey, if you're just gonna give him away, we'll give you a third form." And it really worked out. I think you know, last year Vladar built his game really well, and this year. I would say that process has continued. He had a great preseason and he's, you know, the, you, you don't throw, if you're, if, if you're the flames, you don't throw him in against Edmonton on the second game of the season, the first hockey night in Canada the season. If you're not confident in him, if you're, if you're the flames, you don't put him against Colorado in two out of three meetings last season. If you're not confident in him. And I think he earned that confidence from the coaching staff. And I think he's showing confidence, in his own game and how, you know, think about, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading about flames history. Uh, Think about the toughest job in, in hockey was Mika Kiprasov's backup because he had never freaking played so... 74 games a year. <laughs> yeah, like think, <laughs> think about played. think about the pretty pro- a, a line of pretty promising young goaltenders tried out. I mean, since the, the departure of Roman Turek back to uh back to Czechia, uh who do they have? Two thousand five. They, they had I was just thinking it off my head. Oh, don't uh, try to go. Curtis McElhenney, Phil Sove, Vesa Toscala, uh, Brian Boucher, uh, any number of other guys. You got Craig McDonald, Yo, Jordan Dan Joey Mc- Taylor, Joey McDonald. Uh, yeah, like they uh, have, I love this list. This list it, is like a it's, who's who it's, of it's like Ocean's from. Eleven, except with with goaltenders who had no confidence by the end of it, because like the the, the team had confidence to play their game in front of Mika Kiprasov because he was Mika freaking Kiprasov. But for years, you could visibly see hesitancy in their game in all three zones because defensively, they're like, if we make a mistake, this guy's not very good. Neutral zone. Oh, if we turn it over, it's an odd man rush. This guy's not very good. Even the offensive zone, they couldn't fully commit to the attack because they're worried about things going the other way and then having to themselves out of a hole. But with the the biggest compliment I can give to Dan Vildar is I, having watched all, you know, as much as the flames live as I physically can, they don't look different in the no, shape of their the game in front of either guy that they do in front of Markstrom. They, they, they <laughs> look the same in front of a guy who's played less than 40 NHL games as they do in front of a goddamn best in the trophy runner up. That's incredible. And that, I think that's a testament to how much work Dan has put into his game. And cool. He deserves all the he deserves the playing time he's getting and he deserves all the compliments and accolades he's getting because that's, he's he's stealing games for them or at least the very least keeping them in games they should be in. I think that's a that trade was a win win too because if look at Boston right now, like just look at them and look at their two goalies and what they're doing, and then look at Calgary Vladar. You got all yeah. three in the NHL thriving. You did the, the trade was what was best for yeah. the player involved. The best third round pick. If this Calgary, this is Calgary how them up too. Calgary's this is how the waiver system is supposed to work. By the way, the waiver system is meant to be uh uh a, it's meant to to scare teams away from trying to stockpile goaltenders or stockpile anybody at any position. Uh, same thing with with Yuzo Valimaki. 
you're not supposed to be able to hoard NHL level talent. And Arizona took advantage of, of an inefficiency. They took advantage of the flames having too many guys and the flames took advantage of Boston having too many guys and Boston, I think got fair value. The, the, the third round well, pick yeah. the they flames got, it, right? that was they paid for it with an asset, not the waiver fee, the, which, which was fine. You beat, you, yeah. you, there was going to be, if you had to pay for him, that means there was a market for him. Like there was other yeah. people that wanted him too. And so Calgary just went, well, we need him. And like, they right could have, they could have, they could have crossed their fingers and crossed their toes and hoped against hope. He fell down the way for priority, I, which I, wouldn't have happened. How, or you just say, screw it. How many games did McElhinney play as a flame before he got his first win? I think it was you like remember? 15. Uh, uh, he got his first win at the last game of the season that in year. Second that year. was the, the flames won the division that year. Yeah. But they ran. That was the year that they, that uh, the Flames got all those injuries in the last week of the season, and they finished the season playing three players short for cap reasons because they didn't have enough bodies. So poor Curtis McElhinney in a battle of Alberta in Game eighty two, uh, gets his first win in front of like fifteen skaters because the Flames ran out of money. Yeah, what a yeah. weird like. Yeah, and then Cap- Curtis McLean ended up, and then Curtis McLean ends up playing twenty friggin' years and winning a Stanley Cup. Yeah, Stanley That's Cup just... champion Curtis McLean. Let's let's let's. But I just I'm like we all the years of the Ordios and the Dan Taylors and the all of the junk, the Brian Elliott starting years, the Mike Smith starting years. We never had more than two tangible quality goaltenders, and I don't think, and based on his play so far, anybody should be concerned with what Dan Vladar is doing or going to do. They've got him locked up yeah. for this year, plus two more. They've set the backup market because Peter Kochkov, or I'm definitely saying his name, Kochkov, Kochkov in Carolina got a two million per year extension. So Calgary reset the market for decent and, young and, backups. And, and I think uh, Kochkov actually had fewer games played than Vladar mm-hmm. did. Yeah. So, but like same right agent, now, though. Cool same tending. agent. It doesn't matter. Like if Markstrom falters, it's they're literally showing us that they're quite fine with. Okay, well, Vladar's fine. We'll run yeah. with him. And like, Markstrom, and, figure and your stuff out. You'll be as, here when you're ready. As, as our colleague, as our colleague and barn burner, Brian Pender always says, goaltending is voodoo. Goaltending is weird. So, is it likely that Jacob Markstrom completely forgot how to play goal? Very unlikely. Oh, no. I mean, typically what you see with goaltenders is what happened with Kippersoft, where as you get into your mid to late 30s, your mobility kind of goes and your reaction time sort of slows down because, you, you're, you know, goaltending is tough on the body, it's tough on the joints. Usually it's injuries that slow a goalie down and cause them to be less than they once were. That's what happened with Kippersoft. The last two years at Kippersoft were like, you know, it was a up to here and then injuries, injuries, injuries. Boop. So Markstrom has been healthy, knock on wood. Uh, outside of his unfortunate concussion two years ago, and we're hoping. Uh, honestly, that uh, and as an aside, that was that the the Tanner. My memory of the Tanner piercing collision is the only reason when he started rushing out. I'm like, oh no 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 no. He he initiates. He does that. He runs out of the net sometimes, and just and uh, someone said that it's because he's tired, but there's no reason for him it's, to it's, be tired it's, when it's it because occurred. i wouldn't it's, even say he's tired it's not a tired thing it's i would argue it's because he wants to be the guy he wants to be a difference maker for his team he wants to help them out mm-hmm. he rushes out against vancouver two years ago in a game that's you know the flames aren't playing well in because he wants to beat the guy to the puck and move it up the ice so his so the guy a zone over More can get offense, a scoring chance yeah. uh Oh, you know, the defense breaks down and he wants to bail out his defenseman. So he rushes out there to try to get the puck away from, uh, from Monaghan. I mean, his heart's in the right place. And I think because his heart's in the right place and because he's got a reputation as such a worker that I'm not really terribly concerned about Marks from finding his swagger again. No, the reason get. why is because he has a Dan Vladar. He has a guy who he plays with, who has his back, who, plays a similar style who can sort of help lift him up and they don't need to throw because they have such confidence in Vladar. They don't really need to throw Markstrom in before he's ready. So Dan Ooh. Vladar, this is a, this is a long way of us saying, keep up the good work where I'm, I've been real. I didn't expect, I, I liked Vladar last year. I liked Vladar when he was in Boston in the very small window of, of games. I saw him in. I didn't expect to like him this much this early though. I, I, that's impressive to me. I'm with you on Marshall will bounce back, but my reasoning is a little different. My reasoning is the well-placed def- like structure of the team and how the team plays in front of the goaltender on any given night. I think 
it's going to make it easier for Markstrom to bounce back. As long as he takes the intentional, like the errors, the human error out, like what making those bad plays and just sticks to being a goaltender and, and just playing the goal and leaving the puck and not trying to do too much. I think he gets easily gets back to top tier level. He's, he's got the athleticism and he's got the skill and the team in front of him is always going to give him a chance to be good. Now, there's been nights where Hannafin and Anderson need to pick their socks up and they're not helping and they're giving up way too much defensively, which doesn't help the goalie. But event like, but if the goals keep going in, the finger gets pointed at the goalie first. Um, it's not all on Markstrom. Some of the defensive pairs. I, need- I, I think, I think when but I think those go back. in, I think, I think external goes. fingers are pointed at the goaltender. Like D- Daryl Sutter jokes. He, all he knows is, you know, the highlight he's, reels. He's just bad show- goals. Yeah, but but I mean externally that's that's what you see. And I think that's where the external pressure comes from. I think internally, I think they have a much more fulsome idea of goaltender performance, which is helpful. But I agree with you. I think and I and I think I don't think that's a coincidence that over the last few weeks, this you know, Daryl mentioned the safe percentage has gone up, the goals against has gone down. And the reason for that is A, the goaltenders are performing better, B, more Vladar, and C, this is a big one, the guys in front of them are playing less bad in the defensive zone. Mm-hmm. They weren't playing bad, like horribly badly before, but the 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 yips, so to speak, the the well, noise in the defensive zone has been turned down a bit. There's less less weird stuff coming the other way. And so Dan Vladar hasn't had to be an amazing, spectacular goaltender all the time. He's had to be good quite often, but he hasn't had to be amazing no. because the team in front of him is playing better. When so, you look at the team, you look at the teams they played too. The like in the re- of recently too, like they're weaker teams. They're not they're not the Boston's and the Carolinas and the Tampa's like and the Floridas like they they and the Colorados. Like they went through an onslaught of quality teams, and now they're finally playing teams that m- most likely are not on either equal footing or better. They're below, and they should they should limit defensive chances more if they weren't, then we should be not even considering a playoff spot. We should already be talking about the draft lottery. So the fact that they're getting through these games with wins, regardless who's in net, that's bona fide positive for the team going forward. So I agree. Let's move on to our organic betting discussion brought to you by our friends at Betway. Uh, we're partnering with Betway at the nation network. So, uh, Please, if you if you feel the need to do the things that are legal in Ontario and elsewhere, uh, please do it responsibly. Shane, you uh, we had three games and I got one each the, game, so that's okay. You, yeah, you had uh, I believe so in the Montreal game. Shane's bets were Flames to win, uh, Damn Flames thirty four plus shots on goal, and Monahan to get one or more points. So he had that two, early too. <laughs> two out of three. Two out of three. He got he got the he got the one or more points 13 seconds in. So Shane was feeling Shane 13 seconds in of that Montreal game was feeling like I'll get something. So well, and then the Flames had like the 28 shots at the end of the second period. So I'm like, all right, all right. I think all by the by the, do, by the middle of the third period, you all were they have to do is take all of these chances they're getting and just score on Jake Allen. And I'll go three for three. That's all they had to do. Sorry, Jake and Allen doesn't score. like you that much. Jake Allen hates me. It's fine. So that is not bad. Uh, Wash the Washington game on Saturday. Uh, he bet one. money line and over five and a half goals in the game, and they scored seven goals in the game. So, and two, the Flames won. So it he was got that two one. one with ten minutes to go. Pike. It was two <laughs> one, and I'm telling Mo, I'm like, yeah, no, okay, I'm going. I, over. I bet you. I I'm bet you. The, today. The, the the Flames on the bench are going. We got, we saw Shane's best guys. Of the day. We can't let Shane go over. We got to score some goals. We we got to cover the spread at least. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you also bet unsuccessfully for Huberdo to get one or more points, and Alex Ovechkin get a goal. Ovech uh, Huberdo is plus one, but with two penalties, and he had zero points. Uh, Ovechkin was shockingly ordinary against uh, the Calgary Flames. He. Had his looks on the power play, but the Flames did a good job negating him. So well done, Flames. And unfortunately, you, Shane did not win that one. If you can't bet on Ovechkin to score a goal, who the hell are you going to bet I, on? When to when score a goal? when uh, when I filled in for you on the the bets of the day column uh, last week during the road trip, I was like, he's the third best. He's like he's, he's going to be he, the best. He's the most road goals of anybody he, in he's, history. He's the best non Gretzky goal scorer in the history of the National Hockey League. 
and he's the most road goals, even more than Gretzky. And yeah, he's so on I'd, the road. I'd say, you know, when in doubt, when it regardless of where the game is, especially on the road, yeah, just just vote to say there's, just about bet four, on there's about four players in the league I'm comfortable with betting they'll score every night. Ovechkin. Nikos, Ovechkin. Ovechkin, Matthews, Connor, and right now Jason Robertson. Oh yeah, I put Stamkos as my five. Stamkos if, could if be in healthy. there, but those those healthy. four those four guys, um, Matthews. Everyone's like, well, he's not so much so this year. I'm like, he'll he can still score. It takes him half a second. If if you <laughs> if you if you're a gambler and you bet that uh, that Ovechkin or Matthews or one of these guys will score a yeah. goal every game. If you just if that's the only thing you bet, if you only ever bet. Oh, anytime goal for Matthews or Ovechkin, and you just do it every game. You probably—I haven't done the math probably on this. Money. I'm guessing you turn out, you come out ahead. You bet a dollar every single day or every single game on Ovechkin scoring a goal. Odds are you probably end up with more money than you spent. That's my guess. Yeah, it, it might be marginal, but I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I agree. Yeah, like it's you're, you're, you're you'd be making like. 50 cents bet like yeah. it's because they're the the league's best goal scorers that's how it works like the, just, the the odds are set to basically try to equalize the money in and money out that's how the well, when that, when these teams play each other you can get better odds if you uh usually they have a line where it's uh player can score play, player a from team a or player from tb each to score so like you could go in and find like toronto just played um toronto just played dallas there was a there was a line bet. It was plus I can't remember what the line was, but it was uh, Matthews and Robertson to score. And my girlfriend asked, she's like, "Is that good?" I'm like, "If you can't bet that, what can't like what can you bet right now?" <laughs> Robertson had a tw- eight, nine to eighteen game points streak going where he had twenty one goals. Like, of course you're gonna like that's that's the safe bet. That's like the okay. There's not that many guys that you know can score when they play each other. Slap that every time. Um, and then Arizona, I am so mad about Arizona Pike. Yeah. I am so Ari- Ari- mad. Arizona was a weird one. So, Sixty-two shots. So the we the three the three uh, bets of the day that Shane had for Arizona was the Flames to win by one and a half. They did not. They won by one. Uh, uh, total shots that's over sixty-one and a half, as in sixty-two or more. They got forty-seven or forty-eight. It was very low. It was a low. Sh- it was actually it was for like 49, I think. It was, I think it was like 22, 27. Uh, so that's not it. And he also said uh, that uh, Nas and Kadri would get one or more assists. He got two assists and also had a goal. So he got one. He got he, he had he had one successful recommendation in each of the games. Uh, and in the Montreal game, he had two. So he's kind of on a winning streak. But well, you kind the of hope- win by one and a half, too. I I think it was Rizicka, and he's in the offensive zone, and the Arizona Coyotes net is empty, and he sends the thing a good foot and a half wide of the far post, and I'm like, come on, like, it's an the, empty the, net. The, There's the, not the, even a goalie there. Friends, if you if you're at a game and you see someone get really upset over an empty net goal, chances are they bet on the over under or the yeah, or the puck yeah, on. Only gamblers. Give really them a hug. Care about the the empty netter goal in a in a Go game like for that. the over baby. So yeah, not not a bad week, but I think uh, much much like the Flames game, Shane Shane's uh, recommendations are trending in the right direction. Uh, so we're gonna get into we have a lister question of the week because someone just sent me a question and it was, rec- it was related to some news. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll do a quick uh, related to this before we get to the question. Uh, William Stromgren, uh, Flames' 2021 second-round pick, has been named to Team Sweden for the upcoming 2023 World Juniors Championship Tournament in Halifax and Moncton. So uh, Stromgren plays for Bernas in the SHL. He is a fourth-liner. Uh, he has four points in 24 games. Uh, he's a good checker. He's a two-way guy. Uh, he's 19 and playing a regular shift. when He has a regular role in a fairly decent SHL team. And... For me, I was sort of on the fence about – I was a little bit hesitant to think he'd be making the World Junior team because, you know, his numbers aren't great. He was a good junior player, but as a pro, he hasn't really jumped off the page offensively. But he – he, Yeah, he, and he's he's uh, he's got a two-way reputation. He's playing a two-way role, and he'll probably be a bottom six two-way guy for Team Sweden. And, yeah, I mean, we'll see how he does. But I think it's – you know, for, for a guy that, you know, the Flames got some flack from some folks for not taking Logan Stankoven and taking William Stromgren in that draft. Uh, you're allowed to like, you're allowed to want who you want. I don't care. Uh, 
I like I like Stankoven, but he's not big, and they already have a bunch of not big guys in the system. Uh, they don't have a lot of two way guys that project the way that uh, state that uh, Stromgren does. So I could kind of see why they went the way they did. I don't know if I would have done it that way, but I can I can wrap my head around the, the decision making. But yeah, Stan Coven going to the World Juniors, I believe, for Team Canada. Well, he's on the long list. They had to cut some guys, but he's on the twenty nine man roster, I believe. And Stan yeah, gonna make it. he's gonna, he's going to make it. He'll he'll probably make it. But yeah, he's uh, a holdover. He made it last year. So. Strom Strumpkin going for for Team Sweden is kind of fun. And that really that brings us to the question of the day. So uh, news broke on Wednesday morning that uh, unfortunately Calgary Flames prospect Cole Jordan, a twenty twenty one fifth round pick, will not be playing the remainder of the season for the Moose Jaw Warriors due to an injury. He's going to undergo surgery. And it'll take him out for the rest of the season. Uh, here's the th- here's the, uh, the question of the day was from uh, from one of our readers. It says, "Did the Flames sign Cole Jordan?" So uh, just so folks are aware, so the Flame uh, Cole Jordan as a, a Canadian junior player uh, who is drafted, the Flames have until the second June first after his drafting to sign him or they lose his NHL rights. So the Flames have until June first, twenty twenty three, to sign him or not sign him, and then. They either sign him and they keep his NHL rights or they don't sign him and his NHL rights lapse and then he re-enters the draft. Uh, so Jordan, he's had uh, a tough go of it, uh, say. Uh, he has never played a full Western Hockey League season. He's played four years. He's never played more than, I think, 35 games in each one. I think uh, no, 36 was the – so his, his first year, he was 16-17 kind of he was in and out of the lineup because he was a depth guy uh his draft year he uh it was the, the pandemic shortened year but he only played uh 10 he, he played 23 games and had 10 points and the the scouting book on him was well he plays a great transition game he has good first pass he's got good ability to jump into the rush good mobility good passing everything else is a work in progress but they're like he's got good boots like his fundamentals of his game were solid and that's probably still the case. Uh, but last year, 11 points in 36 games. He struggled with injury. He got hurt early in the season. He, he really wasn't himself. Uh, our friend Joel Henderson, uh, who is a, a scout for any number of great places. So uh, look up Joel Henderson at Dat Hockey Doe, uh, D-A-T Hockey, and then D-O-E. Uh, he's a great follower for, for anyone who wants to know about prospects with the Western Hockey League. Uh, but Joel was a big fan of this guy. Joel noted that he wasn't really himself. He didn't really get back into playing the way he needed to and the way he usually does until like the last third or the last quarter of the season. And then the season was over. This season, uh, he got off to a pretty good start, seven points in 17 games. Looked like he'd be turning a corner and everyone's like, yeah, he's going to be, it turns out he might be the guy that the Flames were hoping he'd be. And then he unfortunately suffers that lower body injury that take him out the rest of the year. So a whole year too. It's not like... So yes. we, we, you know, uh, before we started recording, Shane and I were discussing the, let's say, valimackiness of this, where Jordan, his game is based on puck movement, and awareness, explosive jumping of the rush, explosive passing, those kind of things. The, the, the brains of his game, I'm not really worried about because he's a smart kid. The mobility aspect of going through a significant injury or two right after being drafted if you're a little bit nervous about potentially signing a kid with a couple significant injuries right after his drafting, yeah, I can understand. If you're going, yeah, how many how many Western League games has he played? He's played uh, 53 Western League games since being drafted. That's it, 53 in two years. And part of it's the pandemic, part of it's injury. But 50 is – I think the, the broad question facing the Flames is this. Is 53 games enough – to give him a three-year window of development. It's and not I'm not sure. Just the 53, though. He's played less than 120 over his entire four-year junior span. It's it's not just the last two years. It's also the first ones. That's you get that in a season and a half in the dub if you're healthy. A seat one and a half seasons over four, he's played less than that. And he only has the 10 playoff games. I liked your point. You were like, well, what else do they have? And I'm like, you're right. They they have Kuznetsov, Solyov, uh, and Poye that are young. And then the well, only other defenseman that would be signing eligible would be Jake Boltman, who's got one goal in like 13 games in the Big Ten right yeah, now. Yeah, here's, here's, uh, here's the Flames 
Here, here are the NHL. Here's the defensemen they have that are not currently in the NHL. Uh, Dennis Gilbert, Nick D. Simone, Yang Kuznetsov, Nick Malosh, Jeremy Poirier, Ilya Slavyov, uh, Colton Pullman, Cole Jordan, Jake Boltman, and Cam Wynott. Um, yeah. Pullman's a depth guy. Poirier and Kuznetsov, there's something there, especially with Poirier, but they're work in progress. Solovyov is also a depth guy. I mean, all due respect to the guys, I don't know if they really have much of an NHL future. Uh, and a couple of, a few of these guys are going to be graduating, uh, either either leaving the entry level system or going somewhere else. So if you say to me, if you're if you're if we're in the Flames development meeting, if we're in the hockey ops room, and you have to sell me on him, I'm really nervous about getting him an entry level deal. If you come up to me after the draft and go, hey, no one took Cole Jordan, let's give him an AHL deal, I'm all over that because there's no risk. And if the idea is that if you look at what the Flames have done, especially I'm thinking specifically for Lucas Folk. Lucas Folk had a year – this is his last year of eligibility of uh, – before the flames lose his rights. And so they were, you know, he didn't really get, he was sort of all of the place in Sweden. And they're like, you know what, if we're going to give up on a guy, let's bring him in and see how he does. And so they brought him in, signed him to a deal and the AHL deal, mind you. And they're going to have a chance to play. He's playing in the ECHL right now. And you know, he's, he's not great. His numbers aren't great. He's playing better, but he's the third best four they have on the rapid city rush. Uh, and that take from that, what you will. Uh, Rory Karens, very, very good. Ilias, uh, Ilya Nikolaev, another guy they brought in initially last year. They they helped him find an, uh, a spot in the USHL because they wanted to get more eyes and then they wanted to give him a chance. And then he played really well in the USHL and he got an entry-level deal and he's been pretty good in the in the uh, the ECHL. So if you're telling me, you know what, he he doesn't get, he probably will get drafted based on, based on the same concerns Shane and I have in terms of his sample size and his injury history. If you're thinking, uh, he's 20 next year, you sign him to a one year ECH or AHL deal. You can put him in the coast. You can have him in AHL camp. Your dev staff is in Calgary. And so you can get your hands on him. You can work with him and you can basically just see like, you know, you, you don't draft players. You think suck. You don't draft players. You don't believe it. You draft players because someone like even, even in the seventh round guys, and even in the seventh round of the NHL draft, like I'll say this when the flames drafted Dustin Wolf in 2019, there were guys at the draft table banging on the table. you like, this is the freaking guy. And granted Dustin Wolf's an exception because he fell down the draft for dumb reasons. Cause he's, an amazing goalie who have to be not particularly large for a goalie, but that's the kind of thing. If, if, if you get drafted into the NHL, whether it's in the first round or the seventh round, it's because someone at that table believed in you and made a case for you and said, Hey, listen to me. This is my guy. So someone at that flames table, I don't know which one of the, the area scouts uh, in, in the dub probably would have done it, but they all saw a lot of them that draft here and went, this is our guy. And so I can imagine in when they get to set, you know, after the draft, when they're sitting down and setting their de- development camp roster, when they're talking about guys to sign the depth moves, I can imagine they probably have one or two guys in that room going, you know what? Maybe entry level will be a bit too much for him. We don't know what he is, but you don't know what he's not either. And I think you probably want to give him a chance to play his way into or out of your plans because because of his unfortunate injury luck the last couple of seasons. It's he hasn't really had much of a window to play in or out of your plans the way other guys have. Well, the I I just look at who's available, right? Like what do they have and what who else is there? And the other D that could sign in and rookies, like the only other ones they have are Cameron Wynott, who's been a letdown since he was drafted. He, he's been better this year. He's been better this yes. year. Yes. Well, they should be. You're 20 years old playing against 16, 17 year olds. Like you should be. Um Cole Jordan again hurt and then it's boltman who's not been yeah and, and, and either and, and, and boltman, then boltman and is really a, outside point you have no one internal P- pullman's not it they obviously they, they they don't have faith in uh where is it there malosh if they're caught well that could be a money thing when they're calling a money thing. simone and gilbert but like the other than that like they don't have anybody. They have they they're riding still off the 2015 draft where they got yeah, Anderson they, and Chillington, and then since then they've drafted two impact. They, and if, if the idea One is you want to give yourself options, them. if you want to give yourself options, then 
Like if the idea, better if, job drafting. if the idea is that you're drafting different types of players, so you have different types of guys in your system, they in the entry level system right now they don't outside of like Poirier's. Poirier will get there, I think. Poirier yeah, just I needs to work on his, his play away from the puck. Skills, he, he knows how to put the puck in the net. Yeah, his his offensive skills are good enough that I think you can. Worst case, you put a Tanev with him, and he could just cover cover up his weak points. I mean, they've done that before. They did that with TJ Brody, and he turned out to be pretty good. So I'm not really that concerned about Poirier. But outside of Poirier, who do they have? You don't because Netsov is the best bet. Outside Poirier, yeah. it's Kuznetsov. And Kuznetsov, yeah. Kuznetsov, I like the the fun. Kuznetsov, someone by the third year of his entry level deal, people will be looking at his progression, going, "Hmm, there's something there." But he's but he doesn't have the 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 peaks and valleys of no. of. He's Boy, not he's a producer. Game. He's a he's a defender. He's the, the, some defenders are there to defend, and they're never going to yeah. have high counting stats. And everyone always wants them to be thirty yeah. point guys the, before they get called up. And I'm like, the, the he's AHL not a guy anywhere the ahl is going to be a time to help kuznetsov build his offensive swagger the ahl is a time to help jeremy poirier learn how to defend against grown men but, uh but, but yeah but, for the, but for the jordan of it all i'm saying is if they were to sign him i'd be like well okay because they don't have anything else they yeah, they've yeah. been very bad at drafting defensemen like i said there, there's two Outside, since Anderson and Hannaf- or Anderson and Shillington that are playing in the league, one was never going to play for them, and he's he gets booed every time he comes back, uh, Mr. Adam Fox, and the other one we just saw play for Arizona. Those are the that's it, that's it. Since 2015, those are the only two NHL defensemen. Hey, they, drafted. after they drafted Valimaki, they went like two years though drafting a defenseman because they didn't yeah. have a lot of picks because they traded picks to it because they wanted to to build up the roster. Part, it's, it's part of the price of trying to compete and stay competitive. Like this last draft where they just took uh, three forwards, it's like, okay, well, you have a glaring need on the back end. And if you're not going to go to try and steal KHL, SHL defensemen um, or college defensemen at the end of their tenure, which is what they did with Mackey, who poor Mackey, we didn't even talk about. He's become a forgotten asset already. Um, then you need, you need to draft. And they, they need to do something internally to find a better way to draft defenseman more consistently so i you mean can have more, a steady more picks stream. would be the more picks is the easiest way but yeah I'd, I'd say if, prioritizing if you, your needs <laughs> to, to to circle this square if you said to me are the flames going to sign cole jordan to an entry level deal i would say right now no and they shouldn't if you said to me hey uh should they sign him to an ahl deal after the season's over if he gets through the draft again i'd say yeah there's really no downside to it you know the player if, if you probably to, like yeah. the player if if he if the idea is that you want to get some hands on time with him and you think there's potential and you don't draft somebody you think has no potential, I think that'd be a, a, a pretty decent move. So we'll see what they do. Coming up, Shane, Flames got a, a busy week ahead. So we're recording Four this. Games. We're recording this Wednesday, uh, midday Wednesday. The Calgary Flames are hosting the Minnesota Wild on Wednesday night at the Saddle Home, 6 p.m. start. Uh, and then they're going on the road and they're getting to visit some old friends. First off, they visit Columbus and Johnny Gaudreau on Friday night. Then they go to scenic Toronto, Ontario, where they visit TJ Brody, Mark Giordano, and the Toronto Maple Leafs. And then Monday night, they finish off this three-game road trip, uh, three games in four nights with travel uh, in La Belle Province against uh, the Montreal Canadiens and Sean Monaghan. That'll be fun. And then they're back at home a week from now, next Wednesday, against the Vancouver Canucks for somehow... We're like it'll be like game thirty, I think, of the season. Somehow, yeah. it's the first game of the season for the Flames against the Vancouver Canucks. I think this they first play like four, like four, five, four, five times, right? Yeah, I think it's four. It, it like they should have switched the games Calgary played against Edmonton with the games they played against Vancouver. I know it doesn't work with scheduling. It, it, to be fair, the NHL schedule maker has to look at thirty-two different arenas of scheduled events and then make the schedule. So. I would never want to do that in my life, whether a computer does it or not, regardless. Oh, but, that's it's the most thankless job. In Toronto, the you're missing, you missed. I don't think Brody's going to play. He's been hurt, but you're missing. It's the return of Cali Yarncroft. Cali Yarncroft's going to play. Uh, Flames legend. Yeah. One goal, playoff goal. Forever a flame, Cali Yarncroft. Uh, he'll be back. Elias Lindholm's cousin. Yeah. Um, yeah, I. I don't know. I, I, Columbus is reeling. Uh, Toronto is the opposite of reeling. <laughs> and, uh, 
I wonder if Mitch Marner's point streak lasts another week. Because tr- trust me, you'll hear about it all day on Saturday and Friday and the Thursday. I, I'm pretty sure at some it. point people people that my mailman is going to knock on my door and ask me if I heard about Mitch Marner's point streak. Yeah, <laughs> hey, the Ama- you know, he's the, up to 24 games. 20. The Amazon guy, the guy who delivered my microphone, is going to be like, "Did you hear about the point streak?" Yes. Enrique, I heard heard about the to be fair, it does remind me. Uh, there's two vivid ones in my mind that I remember for the, of recent years, and it was the Crosby and the Patrick Kane point streaks that were so predominantly talked about because no one else was doing it. This one was kind of like, well, Jason Robertson's there as well. Well, Marner's extended and Roberts has ended, so it's just kind of a fun little tidbit. It's a good storyline. Leafs are rolling though. Make no mistake. When the Leafs, when Calgary goes to play on Saturday on a back to back, that game will be very, very hard to win. And then we're, we're, we're going to be at a five o'clock starts before too long, guys. So I hope you enjoy the early evenings because we're going to come before Christmas. They have a California road trip. So I hope you're ready for eight, oh. eight 30 starts. Yeah, I'll be good. The, I'm glad it happened. The eight 30 starts happen when I'm off school. So like I can just stay up late and I mean, I'm late every night, but up all night with Shane. Yeah, and like that's okay. If, if I always know it's two a.m. and I need to talk to someone, Gould's always always up too, so we're good. He just never sleeps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know. So Flames Nation Radio brought to you by DoorDash and Eau Claire Distillery, makers of Rupert's Whiskey, the official whiskey of the Calgary Flames, makes a great gift. Uh, you can find us on basically anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, of course, if you're looking at our beautiful faces, you found our YouTube page. So thank you. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the brand new Flames Nation YouTube. All the great Na- Flames Nation content. None of the other teams in the league filler of, from the other beautiful people at the Nation Network. We love our colleagues at the other websites. But we understand if you're going, I don't want to, I don't really want to see any more Mitch Marner stuff than I need to. Uh, this should be all the Mitch Marner stuff you really need to get out of us. Yeah. Uh, so please be sure to like and subscribe to the content. Uh, please leave comments, reviews on our, on our podcast, wherever you can. Uh, we appreciate the feedback and we appreciate uh, the engagement. So we'll be back in a week when we'll be teeing up an exciting game between the Flames and a divisional rival. Something that's been, Shane, a bit of a rarity. They have not played a lot of games within the Pacific Division. And I would argue more so than anything else has been going on this season. Their play against their own division will decide if they make the playoffs, if it's eight days wasted, or if they miss it entirely. They have huge games against LA, Seattle, and... um there's the other team and Vegas left those three teams. They're, they're almost out of their one game against Edmonton hey, with hey, the end of his month. They, too. uh, they got some games against Anaheim and San Jose and Vancouver. And if you, if you ain't running, if, if you can, you, gotta win you can, su- you can survive punching even against Edmonton and Vegas and LA and Seattle. If you're running the table against the other guys, That's if true. you're not life is going to be a challenge. And, We'll see if the Flames can make life easy or make things a bit challenging for yeah, themselves. They really, they've probably got like 25-some division games left, don't they? Like a lot of teams probably yeah. done that. Calgary's got a ton left. The Flames have almost – the Flames have played most of their Eastern Conference games already. They've closed they up the season last series. Year, like, too. Like, what a weird schedule. They're going to have – no. Like they're going to spend the entire month of March at home again. <laughs> or we're not leaving the Pacific Division. Yeah. Yeah, so, just, just in your time zone, yeah. So that'll do it for Shane and I. Thanks very much for listening, watching, posting, prodding, commenting. We'll see you guys in a week. Everyone have a great week and make sure you get your holiday shopping done because don't be like us and re- wake up on December 12th and go, oh shit, I need to go do all my shopping because oh shit, I need to do all my shopping. See you in a week. <laughs>